Outside, should I run and hide? How do I take my company worldwide? Do you love the law? Did you watch Hee Haw? What's the weirdest thing that you ever saw? What's it like in court? Favorite sport? Can you help with my book report? Is my hair too long? Am I right or wrong? And do you mind if I sing along to anything? Ask Alan anything in the world. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of Ask Alan the Podcast. I'm Alan Crone, the CEO of the Crone Law Firm, and uh, I've got a very special guest with me today, uh, attorney Tamara uh, Walker from Chicago, Illinois, but I suspect uh, that, uh, Ms. Walker, you've got a Memphis connection. I do, I do. Tell me about your Memphis connection. Sure, thanks for having me. So it's it's not as much of a connection as I was born and raised in Memphis, Tennessee, um, subsur- suburbs, kind of, sort of. Um, so I came to Chicago about 20 years ago, but I'm a born and bred Southern Belle at one point. I don't know about today. Where'd you go to high school? I say, you know, that's a Memphis question. I got to ask you, where'd you go to high school? Yes, White Station High School. Oh, very good. Uh, the Spartans. Yes. The Spartans. Spartans. There you go. Look at you. Good job. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, I, I grew up here, uh, but I, long story, but I went to high school someplace else. A boarding school, so I, I I don't know my high schools as well as I should, but my all my kids went to Christian Brothers, so um, uh, I've I've got that that going for me, uh, which is which is nice. Yeah, one of my uh, first cousins went to Christian Brothers. Very familiar. Where uh, where did you do your college in law school? I went to Emory University in Atlanta for undergrad, and then Notre Dame for law school. Very good. Shake down the thunder. <laughs> Two opposite experiences. No, uh, Emory does not have varsity football. So then you can imagine my first home game at Notre Dame was like something from the movies. I'd never seen something like that before. It was absolutely incredible. It, it really is. It's a it's a bucket list uh, yes. item for a lot of people to go up and see a game. Even if they're not a Notre Dame fan, it's just a right. great experience. It really is. I always like asking lawyers this because the no two stories are the same. But how did you decide? I, I want, I want, I want to be a lawyer. <laughs> you know, that's a great question. I am one of those people that was honestly influenced by television. As crazy as that sounds, I was watching L.A. Law as a twelve-year-old. Before then, I wanted to be a chemist. But it was something about L.A. law that just really drew me in. Um, I particularly related to the black lawyer played by Blair Underwood. You know, it was a man, but still, you know, I was he was kind of a mover and a shaker amongst the power players at the firm. And that was really interesting to me to see it from that perspective. I hadn't seen that before. I mean, granted, I was 12, but still. Uh, <laughs> so that is what first piqued my interest. And from there, I did everything I could. I did mock trial every year of high school, you know, any opportunity that I could to further my craft and to determine was this, you know, the actually the right path I took advantage of. So did you do like a pre-law um, major at uh, Emory or what did what what preparation did you do at Emory for, for going to law school? Well, Emory doesn't actually have pre-law. Well, at the time, I don't know what they have now, but at the time they didn't have pre-law. So political science, you know, the typical major uh, with the sociology, actually was a double major, political science and sociology um, with an African-American studies minor. And thanks to White Station's phenomenal advanced placement programs, I was able to do both in four years, which was not easy, but uh, I wanted, it was important to me to try to get that done and, you know, get it done and not have to stay extra. Um, so that was my pathway while at Emory, we didn't have like a pre-law society and and different things. Well, some things they had in place, but it definitely needs to be expanded. So I worked on expanding the programs that were available, the moot court options. Uh, I was a co-founder of the minority pre-law society. So just continue to further advancing towards the ultimate career. I always envy people that from an early age, had a strong sense of what they wanted to do um, and then set out to do it. And uh, so that you're, you're to be commended for that. That's uh, that's awesome. Well, you know, I always say um, thank you, first of all, but I always say that, you know, I really am blessed and grateful that 
what I was drawn to at the age. Cause I agree. I think it definitely helps to set your life on a course where you're able to set goals and do things in a way more efficient than people who are still searching into their twenties, for instance. So, but I, I, you know, I'm just blessed and grateful that not only was I actually able to attain it, but that I actually like it, you know, most days. So <laughs> that's the bigger blessing too. What, what do you think the state of the profession is for women of women of color, particularly? Well, you know, I, I've seen a lot of advancement. I've been practicing since 2000. That's when I came out of Notre Dame. And, you know, it's definitely changed a lot from the days where I would be mistaken for a clerk or a court reporter to now we have, uh, you know, a justice on the Supreme Court. So I think it's been a tremendous amount of growth. There's obviously still uh, room to grow. There's still areas of improvement that are needed. But I definitely see the representation uh, improving. And most importantly, I think that, you know, the importance of diversity is not just surface. You know, younger people need to understand, and particularly when it comes to areas like criminal justice, where you have so many race and socioeconomic factors that intersect, you know, it's extremely important that you see attorneys who are representative of who's sitting in those courtrooms charged. So I think that that aspect has been very important, but, you know, also obviously on the corporate side, on the probate side as the baby boomers age, you know, on every level, I think it, that representation is, is just critical and it's, it's, I like where it's going and I just want to see more. Right. Right. Do you, do you, th do you see a, a difference in, um, on the, the person of color side or the, the, the gender, uh, Gender side, obviously, I'm I'm neither a woman nor a person of color, so I'm always interested in that because, um, you know, it it, it seems to me that America is going to be better when we when we don't have to have this conversation. But in order to get there, I think we have to have this conversation. So I want to make sure that I, I'm not quite grasping what you're saying. You're saying from the perspective of like difficulties in being a woman versus difficulties in being a person of color. Yeah, yeah. I it, is there any you have any observation about that or is it, is it, um, are, are the two inseparable in your, in, in your, in your case? Well, I mean, in terms of how I see the world, obviously I'm a black woman. I can't speak to anyone else's experience on that, but I think that the interplay is interesting, obviously. Well, I don't know how obvious it is to everyone in my mind. It's obvious that the male, the, um, law profession is still very much male driven. The numbers are changing. Um, there are a lot more uh, female attorneys. I think that it's, it's an interesting question. From the perspective of, I would say, how I've been treated in court, you know, by judges, court staff, that type of thing, I think being a woman probably was more, I'm not even going to say an issue, but I guess stood out more you know, became something where I felt as if this is happening because I'm a younger woman, you know, versus this is happening because I'm Black. I would say it that way. And I also think that sometimes judges, because a lot of judges are male, uh, relate better to men and men seem to be taken more seriously, listened to more. I've definitely observed that. And that's been pretty recently that that observation goes on. So I guess from that perspective, I, I suppose my answer is is as a woman, um, but you know you can't divorce them. Right, right. I, I, yeah, that's it's interesting perspective because the one word you threw in there that you know I think I think has more often is young. You know, I think that there are a lot of lawyers that that uh, you know tend to try to take advantage of younger lawyers lack of experience or whatever. Sure. Um, but I've definitely seen, you know, just my own observation, you know, I've seen my female colleagues and my wife, who's a lawyer, mm -hmm. uh, mistaken for court reporters or, mm -hmm. um, you know, some uh, paralegal or or what what have you, whereas that doesn't happen very much at all with 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 my male counterparts. So yeah. we've we've come a yeah. long way, but we got a lot. We got a lot way, long way to go. And, and uh uh, certainly having someone like you who is a, a great role model for uh, young women and young people of color um, is a step on step in the right direction there. Uh, so uh, now I understand that you um, 
that you worked with Johnny Cochran for a while. I did. I did. Tell um, me about the, tell me about that. So that is a very interesting story. Um, Mr. Cochran was attending the National Bar Association, which is the historically Black Bar Association. So the National Bar Association convention was in Memphis that year. That was in, ooh, that was the summer of 98. And so, 1998. Um, yeah. And so I knew that he would be in town. It just so happened my grandfather, he was one of the first Black police officers to ever serve in Memphis. It was a class of seven. He is the sole survivor at 95 years old. Um, and so he's very well connected at home. He happened to know the head of Mr. Cochran's security. His uh, security guy, the guy who was the head of security, was throwing a party at his house. I knew that obviously Mr. Cochran was going to be there. I was, you know, it's funny. I knew who he was when I was like 12, 13. So when the world knew who he was from OJ, I was like, no, <laughs> this is my person. that I, I am supposed to have this destined pathway. So got myself ready, had my resume, was at the party, walk in the door. I'm nervous. I see him sitting there. He's eating a plate of ribs. This is Memphis after all. And so <laughs> <laughs> that like kind of melted away some of the nerves. He stopped and introduced himself to me. And I was like, I am very well aware of who you are. So we're joking back and forth. And he was asking me about the first year of law school. I had just completed my first year of law school. So he was, you know, I said, I, it's, I'm glad that it's over, you know, that type of thing. So, so he was just really, really personable. And he said he was going to talk to me before he left. So then towards the end of the party, we ended up uh, speaking and, you know, we were in an area that wasn't as loud from the party. So gave him my resume. He went over it. He was impressed. He promised me a job. Uh, I was like, I have two years left of school. How is that going to work? Um, but he did give me his personal assistance information on the back of his business card. Um, and I, my mother made sure that I courted the personal assistant for the next two years. And when I was ready to graduate um, Notre Dame, we had won the um, national trial competition. We won the national championship. So that was obviously a big deal. And that kind of put me back on his radar. One of his national partners also attended Notre Dame. So he took me under his wing as well. And I was fortunate my third year, I, you know, met with everyone, set my interviews and it came down to Chicago, New York and Atlanta. Well, very good. Very good. So, um, so did you get to, to work on cases with him or how, how did, how did that work? You got any good stories? <laughs> you know, honestly, I was such a small fry at that time because our damages threshold was $300,000. They clearly were not letting someone fresh out of law school do a whole lot. But we did, uh, I worked days and nights and weekends, all that type of thing on the Latanya Haggerty case. So that case, I don't know how well known it's outside of Chicago, but it was a, it was a police chase, lower speed police chase where police had engaged with the vehicle the gentleman had asked the police to meet him nearby where his aunt owned the Chicago Defender. It's a historic uh, black newspaper here in Chicago. I think it's one of the first in the country. So he kind of led them on this, chase isn't even really the right word, but a pathway to his aunt's office. There were some rookie officers who were the ones following him. They had been called off. They, they called into dispatch. Dispatch said, you know, cease what you're doing. It wasn't a serious offense. And they continued to follow in pursuit. So once the gentleman stopped his vehicle, he had a passenger, a young lady. Uh, she was 27. And the officer, she had a sandwich in her hand. It was in a foil wrapper. The officers mistook it for a gun, shot the girl to death. Oh. So that was a huge case. We worked on it a lot. Mr. Cochran was in town a lot. We anticipated it going to trial. So it settled at the last minute. So I work, got to work with him quite a bit during that, but unfortunately didn't get to personally see him in action in trial. Well, uh, that, uh, that had to be a great foundation for your career. Absolutely. Um, so you, you did the state's attorney thing for a while. I left um, Cochran's office in Chicago and they did some structural things that you know, just junior associates, it just really wasn't, it, it became a draw instead of salary. Um, so it just wasn't conducive. So I don't want to say it like I left. It was more so 
it was a structure change. It just wasn't, especially me not being from Chicago, it just wasn't a good fit at, at that point with the way that the office restructured. Um, so yes, I was fortunate enough to really get into my training ground and really sink my teeth into how I try to case, how the system works, the entire experience from being a state's attorney taught me everything I needed to know for what my practice is now. Yeah, yeah, that that that's that's a great training ground for any Absolutely. trial lawyer to get those kind of reps must must be, must have been very valuable for you. It was it was a horrible experience. It was a great experience. It was like everything in one. <laughs> Only because I mean, there were days in one of my courtrooms, my judge was just obsessed with work. And he was slow, but he would hold over four or five trials a day. There were times I would do three hearings in three trials. I mean, it was it was complete trial by fire. And he was the type, you know how they say, you want to dot your I's and cross your T's? He was, that was literal. Like he would <laughs> literally throw a sentencing order back because an I wasn't dotted. I had to memorize statutes because he, we had to amend the complaints on the spot where the officers had, you know, not put everything from the statute in there perfectly. Oh, sorry, that's my cell phone. Um, it was, like I said, the best of times, the worst of times, but it, it, I don't think anything else could have equipped me for where I am now. Well, based on what you've told me, it sounds like uh, not only were you uh, uh, intent on being a lawyer, you, you were intent on being a trial lawyer from the very, very beginning, right? You know, that's funny. <sighs> Initially, my impression of an attorney was definitely based on trial law. However, as I aged and went through college, it kind of changed. And I actually was looking at international law. Hmm. You know, I had a conversation with a colleague about the interplay of family life and career and what that would look like if I, you know, kind of realized my, my vision of international law. And they kind of urged me to really kind of prioritize what I wanted and try to make a decision that way. So that was kind of what led me away from international. And honestly, the trial law portion, while I idolized trial lawyers and I did mock trial and all of that, in some ways, I don't know that I envisioned myself doing that portion. It just kind of evolved that way, I, I guess you could say. I was drawn to the courtroom, but I just never imagined. What's funny, on our quest when we won nationals, um, that was in 2000, um, the regional competition was in DuPage County, in the DuPage County Courthouse. That's where I ended up being a state's attorney just a few years later. And I, you know, had absolutely no idea that those types of things would occur. So I somewhat fell into trial law, although I was always drawn to it, if that makes any sense. It makes sense. It makes sense. Um, now, I've seen you on court TV, haven't I? You have. Tell me about that. How how does uh, a gal from Memphis uh, <laughs> get uh, get hooked up with Court TV? You know, Court TV, and this is this is something for anyone in the profession out there. People talk about our system being adversarial, and there's this vision that lawyers are you know at each other's throats. But honestly, some of my best connections have been from colleagues. I got hooked into Court TV from another colleague who's on Court TV here. And she's another Black female attorney. She had every reason not to give me the producer's information because I'm in competition for her. But, you know, we looked at it as a collaborative. So if she's on, I'm watching to make sure, hey, you know, you may, your, your headphones are showing, you know, tuck your hair over it, or, you know, we're giving each other tips. We're making sure the other is better. And that aspect has been phenomenal. So there's a few of us who do media appearance, appearances, and so, you know, the court TV thing kind of coincided with when I was on the legal team for Jesse Smollett and it was just post the trial. So that timing was good. Uh, my producer at court TV is phenomenal, really amazing woman. And it's been a really great experience. I'm, I'm enjoying it quite a bit. Well, good. You, you see, uh, you see yourself going more towards the celebrity end of it or you gonna you gonna stay a a, a a trial lawyer? Great question. I don't know that I have the answer. Um, I was fortunate to realize my absolute dream, which was being on CNN. Um, CNN did a documentary. Well, it was CNN Plus 
Um, CNN Plus did a documentary about the Smollett case. So I was a part of that myself and one other attorney from the team, as well as his family and uh, the state's attorney, Kim Fox and the police. It was pretty much from all perspectives. I think it was pretty well balanced. Um, I've been contacted to do another documentary not related to that case. And uh, there's a few other things in the works. So I don't know. In some ways, you know, all of us trial lawyers are big hams, basically. So in some ways, I'm, I'm definitely drawn to that potential aspect. However, you know, trading your anonymity for fame is no small thing. And I have a family. I have two small kids in addition to a husband. So it's a lot that goes into that decision. For now, I'm just kind of seeing where things take me. Well, you know, there's another uh, uh, Tennessee-born uh, lawyer who made that jump, and that was Fred Thompson. Um, and, uh, you know, Fred uh, played himself in a, a movie about uh, Ray Blanton and and uh, whistleblower uh, Marie. Gosh, I can't think of her last name. Um, but Marie, I think the name of the movie was Marie. And mm -hmm. he played himself because he was her lawyer. And uh, that kind of put him on the map. And he did, as you know, he did a, a bunch of movies and became a U.S. senator. So... Right. Senator Walker, I, I look forward to, to seeing you go down that path. <laughs> that from your lips to God's ears, that would be <laughs> definitely my, not my vision, but who knows? Who well, knows? you never know. That's the thing about the Lord. Exactly. exactly. You know, all of a sudden you wake up and you find yourself in the in the Senate or in the movies or uh, <laughs> in the well of a courtroom, saving somebody's life or uh, changing their life with a good uh, personal injury verdict. You just Absolutely. never know. And, and that's what, what makes being a lawyer so great is you just never know what's around that corner. At least that's what I love, love about it. Absolutely. I agree. It's one of the few professions where you have that freedom and flexibility. And I definitely appreciate that aspect. You know, I ended up starting my own practice six years ahead of schedule. So, you know, it's been a blessing. I always looked at it like my plan was to be in Chicago long enough to get reciprocity. And I was either gonna go practice in Atlanta or go back home. I'm a Southern girl. I definitely did not expect to still be in the Midwest 22 years later. <laughs> um, but, you know, opportunities come. And I, I looked at it like if I open my practice and I fail and I'm eating ramen every night or something, then I can go get a job. But I owe it to myself to give myself this opportunity to see, can I make this work? Can I really, you know, have a practice on my own terms? Do I have enough experience? Do I have enough business acumen? All of those things are, you know, in my experience, it was on the, in the, on the job training. And I definitely agree with your assessment that in our profession, sky's the limits in terms of, you know, where you can end up what your vision is of your practice area, you can change it. You know, most of my friends from law school were not in the same job a year later, you know? And I, I think that's what's interesting. It used to be when we were in law school, it was, you know, get with this big firm that you summered with after second summer. And uh, that's how you get your first job and you're with them until you become partner and you get on the equity track. It's not like that anymore. And so you have to be adaptable. You have to be willing to, you know, roll with the punches to an extent and stay open. Well, Tamara, I appreciate you being on the show. We're about out of time. I want to make sure people know and we'll put it up here on the screen. Uh, your website is defendchicago.com. And it. if you're if you're listening to this from Chicago and you, God forbid, you need a lawyer. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, oh, goody, I get to go hire me a lawyer. today." <laughs> but if you find yourself in that position, defendchicago.com, Tamara Walker would be my choice if I needed a lawyer in Chicago. Um, I really have uh, enjoyed talking with you, Tamara. We'll have to uh, continue this conversation later. But I know that uh, great things are in store for you. And um, I appreciate uh, you doing the show. Well, thank you, Alan. Thanks again for having me. And thanks for putting my contact information out there. I look forward to connecting with viewers who may have a need. Thank Very you. good. Very good. All right, everybody. Thank you for, for watching. If you enjoyed this and my goodness, why wouldn't you have enjoyed it? Please share it or email it to somebody. Share us on social media or email it to somebody you know that might benefit from it. 
um, send me an email or contact me. Let me know if there's a, a guest you would like to see on the, on a, on a net, uh, on a future show. So, uh, again, uh, Tamara and I, we're going to go out and get a little justice and we hope you have a great day. Thank you all so much.